Thank you for joining today. Welcome to Global Hemp Association. Um, I'm really excited to have Luke um, share some of the experience and what he has going on. I had no idea um, how much you really were doing, Luke. And so this is even more exciting for me. Um, and there's a lot of familiar faces. Um, Amy, thank you very much for joining. Hello, it's good to see you. Um, but if you guys have any questions throughout this, don't hesitate to drop them in the chat. Uh, the purpose is this for, of this is for you guys to have an opportunity to ask questions, get to know each other, build relationships. Um, take this time to you know, get to know or kind of figure out who people are, and then we can and then connect with them offline. If you guys need help with that, I'm happy to help support those relationships or create a platform for you to build those relationships. The purpose of this really is to connect the supply chains um, and move this industry forward. So without further ado, Luke, I'd love to turn it over to you and have an intro real quick about what you've been working on. Uh, we spoke a lot behind I guess, before we started. And so I'll kind of just let you take it from here and plug in where you leave off. All right, sure. Um, Thank hello, everybody. Thanks for oh. uh, showing up. Yeah, go ahead. Real quick, I want to, um, for those of you that aren't very familiar with Zoom, you can move your little screens around. If you click on it and drag it, you can put Luke at the top or pin him or change your display so that him and or I are at the top or whoever is talking is actually moved to the top. So just know your screen is pliable. You can move it around to make it more user-friendly. With that, Luke, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, hello again. Uh, thanks for uh, being on and being interested in, uh, well, hemp first and foremost, but also natural fiber welding. So my, my name is Luke Haberhals. I am a PhD chemist. It's my technical training. And then I was a professor of chemistry at the United States Naval Academy from 2008 through 2013. And while I was there, I was, so my, my, my PhD in chemistry is in analytical uh, sciences and material science. So making measurements, making materials, measuring them, seeing what they are, et cetera. Uh, and when I went off to the Naval Academy to be a professor, I had this, um, uh, unique hypothesis, I'll, I'll just say, in the world, which is um, for the last 120 or more years, humans have been making a lot of interesting materials, a lot of really useful materials from fossil resources, from things we dig up in the ground that are long dead. Of course, there's there's uh, externalities to, to doing that. And uh, if you stop and think about what makes petrochemicals and plastics so successful, the way I thought about it as a material science scientist was that uh, if, if you could make natural materials moldable and shapeable in the ways that petrochemicals and, and synthetic polymers are moldable and shapeable, then that's the way to revolutionize manufacturing and how we make a lot of things, footwear, furniture, car interiors, your clothes, et cetera. Uh, and so armed with a unique hypothesis on building things directly from nature, not breaking them down and trying to fit them into the petrochemical industry, not trying to biotech the whole world because it doesn't scale from a cost perspective. I started thinking, how could I make natural complex composites using inputs like hemp and, and cotton and, and other things that are you can grow? And then that led me to... Um, ultimately start a company. I'll, I'll be really brief on this part. My five years at the Naval Academy was wonderful. Ended up, my wife and I have three uh, darling little girls um, at home, and we wanted them to know grandpas and grandmas in the Midwest. I'm originally, I grew up on a farm in Iowa. My wife grew up in Iowa City, Iowa. We landed in Illinois, in Peoria, Illinois is where I'm calling from today. Uh, and that was to, um, took a job at Bradley University, who was kind enough to hire me as a chemistry professor. And then a few years into that, I started re recognizing that was what was really waking me up in the morning as much as I love being a professor and, and teaching and things. What was really waking me up was this opportunity to revolutionize the world in terms of how we make our, our clothes and our footwear and our furniture and our car interiors. And so I, with a very healthy dose of optimism and a much larger dose of ignorance, I started a company. And then... <laughs> Fortunately, I met I met some really uh, brilliant people that agreed with this idea that this could be done, and um, now we're about 
five, almost six years into the natural fiber welding experiment. And we work with brands like, I saw Neil, Neil Bell is on here today. So I don't, Neil, you can speak up later and say what you want to publicly about NFW. But anyway, we work with brands, Ralph Lauren, um, you can Google and find things about natural fiber welding and Ralph Lauren and natural fiber welding in Allbirds and natural fiber welding in Porsche. Uh, there's literally many dozens of footwear and footwear brands and, and brands, automotive companies, et cetera, that want to build products in a different way. And the, the big idea again is that um, maybe I can show you one thing to, and then I'll yield the, the mic to the first sets of questions or something, but. Um, Keep going. You're just sure? you okay. I'll, I'll show if, if you're all okay. I'll show you a few materials that we that we've made. So um, one thing I can show you is so this is this is a I'm going to hold it up close. But if y'all can see that, that's just yarn. That yarn is made of cotton. And today in the world, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this more in a bit. But why why we use as much cotton as we do? Um, but this yarn, there, there's a reason why people aren't happy with this kind of input when they go to make a performance athletic, you know, say apparel and why they use polyester. It's because polyester can be molded and shaped into filaments. So one of the things, one of the core things that natural fiber welding can do is it can take a yarn like this. that has got short fiber, um, can take recycled cotton where the fiber is too short and we can turn it into yarn that looks like this and by molding and shaping. And what that allows us to do is make regular things like t-shirts, but now regular things that are t-shirts that might be made from hemp or cotton and they wick moisture and they dry quickly and they breathe in ways that you would normally think that the synthetic uh, would do. But anyway, natural material can do it. Also on fabrics, there's certain kinds of fabric constructions that you can't easily make with staple fiber and now with fiber welding, you can make stretchy things that stretch and recover mechanically that don't have to use fabric. That's a product we call Claris, uh, which is a line of performance fabrics that are going into the world um, with Ralph Lauren and others. Then we um, do other things like here's a leather-like material. It's the world's only version of a leather-like material that is 100% all natural nutrients. So I know there's people that claim that they grow things on a mushrooms, but they they use petrochemical coatings and things. And this is 100% natural, um, uses a variety of different ingredients. And this material is actually recyclable back into itself. We call it Miram. Um, and then we have technologies that make things like foams, right? So you can see what kind of shape this is. And I'll get to that in a bit. Here's the world's first recyclable shoe sole. Um, and which means that you can make the entire shoe in a different way which if you can do a shoe this way, then you can do bags in different ways. And it means you can do car door panels in different ways and all sorts of, of things that, um, you know, if you aren't happy with that shoe, here's a different one. Um, so all kinds of uh, different applications. Then again, in soft materials, where today we use plastics, polyester, polyurethane, polyethylene, polypropylene. Instead, we can use cellulose, lignocellulose, hemp, you know, well, hemp being uh when you cottonize it, mostly uh, cellulose, but also the pith, of course, or the, the herds is lignocellulose. And so working with materials like that, vegetable crop oils, so the hemp oils also are potentially very useful for NFW, making complex composites directly from nature, molding and shaping those natural nutrients in ways that allows a new material that performs uh, and then does so in a way that displaces plastic so that the world isn't so over-dependent on you know, one sixth of the world's carbon footprint is making plastics. Most people don't recognize that. And the, the truth is it's, it's actually probably worse because there's satellites flying around the world right now and showing, showing that the, you know, some people forget about things like the fact that cows are actually plant-based themselves. But when you're making plastics and things from petrochemicals, that's all fossil car carbon that was long ago locked away in the ground and satellites flying around the world now showing that methane emissions from fossil fuel extraction is much higher than has ever been previously reported. And that data needs to get digested by scientists and put into models about whether it's the true external, uh, you know, negativities that go along with making things, so many things from plastic. Um, maybe the last thing I'll say is um, 
So think of maybe one other way to describe what natural fiber welding is, is think of us as bakers. So just like a, a chef can make you many different kinds of dishes and you think about what's in the kitchen, there's staple ingredients like flour, sugar, eggs, milk, et cetera. Um, and then you think about how, depending on how those ingredients are chosen, which ones are chosen, which ones aren't, depending on how the eggs are used, are you gonna use all the whole egg or just the yolk or just the whites, right? Depending on how those ingredients are prepared, the orders of mixing, you might make one kind of dish here and one kind of dish here and then combine them later. Um, but you can imagine, imagine a world where gigatons of co-products and byproducts and waste products from regenerative agriculture that already is abundant in this world and already just being produced by people like my father and my brother who are farmers, those materials can be molded and shaped directly into things that then displace the petrochemical industry. So you trade in all of your oil rigs and your fleets of ships and your, your um, pipelines and your refinery systems in for what green fields can grow and what kinds of mixing technologies and baking technologies and things that you already have in your, in your kitchen. So that's the kind of things that we're focused on doing because those things scale and they scale in a way that allows more billions of people on planet earth to live well without the conflict and without the, the problems associated with making so many things that are energy intensive to produce. So anyway, that's me. Um, and I'm ha very happy to tell you how, hemp, how I see fitting into that picture and some of the, the challenges, but also some of the opportunities for hemp to be a, a, a real key resource in really a, what, what I would say is a new bioeconomy that is not the bioeconomy that breaks every kind of biomass down and tries to fit it into the existing models, but tries to build up from, from what farmers can grow. Yes, well, and you had said previously when we were talking, you know, that when you were showing me all of these different things you'd made, that the real opportunity for them to involve hemp and what type of material you're looking yeah. for that would be used and so forth. So, yes. So, I'm yeah. Let's let's talk about that because I think that'll get us into you know just some recognition of things that the hemp industry again cha both challenges but also opportunities. So I'm sure many people on the call know that you can take the out, outside bast fiber from hemp and you can put it through various processes and there's mechanical means and chemical means and different versions to get a a, a fiber that's a lot like cotton. Um, today in the world. Farmers around the world are, will grow about 55 billion pounds of cotton. That's in contrast to about 100 billion pounds of, of polyester made for the textile industry. So these numbers are quite large. Um, and cotton, there's a very, very well-defined, well-understood system of grading the fiber. Um, and one of the primary metrics, though, about cotton fiber, for example, is its length. So generally speaking, people pay more money for longer fiber. So when you break down then uh, hemp fiber in the various ways that it can be broken into fiber and you, you cottonize it, then you want to pay attention to the length because today in the today's world, you know, there's systems, there's cotton incorporated, which is a part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, spends time training people to, to grade bales of cotton so that bales of graded cotton gets sold at the right kind of price points and um, folks can uh, you know make blue jeans and, and different things from that knowing what the properties are going to be because the properties are highly correlated to that length and quality of fiber. Um, so one of the things that again natural fiber welding what I discovered at the Naval Academy was that short fiber which has is less value in the world today it has less value because of the nature in which how yarn is made. So yarn is made by spinning this fiber, aligning this fiber and spinning it. Uh, and then basically it's, it's friction that is holding together those yarns and then more friction when you end up knitting or weaving uh, those yarns to make fabric. And so what we, can, what we do is we, we have this process where we mold and shape the yarn, for example, or we can also mold and shape you know, fabrics and things like that too. But it's really useful on the yarn because what it does is, it increases the performance, the value of that short fiber. So I mentioned 55 billion pounds of cotton grows each year, but there's more than 100 billion pounds of fiber that's sitting in our closets 
right now that won't get recycled because when you mechanically break down a cotton t-shirt, it goes into shorter fiber that's not suitable really to make good quality product from. Um, when you break, when you make cottonized hemp, one of the biggest limitations that I can see right now, um, other than just some basic things like that I mentioned before about standards, is that when you look at the price, the cost that it takes to produce hemp cottonized fiber, and you compare the price of the hemp and its length, and you look at that ratio, and you compare that versus the price to performance ratio, the length to price ratio of, of what you get from cotton uh, and the ratio, anyway, there's, there's a disparity in that ratio that makes people keep choosing the, the cotton. So even though, you know, hemp has been legal to grow in China for many decades, they still grow huge amounts of cotton for, for those basic reasons. Um, but where I think NFW can help or what I suggest that, um, you know, when we're, we're talking with some people in the industry about is, hey, go ahead and make that hemp fiber anyway, and then natural fiber welding can solve this short fiber issue. So that, that's really interesting because we could also say on the positive side to hemp is there's no boll weevil issue to worry about. Hemp is a fast growing crop that doesn't require the pesticide. Um, you can grow hemp in equatorial region, regions and get two, you know, or more, you get more than two crops a year, depending on what variety uh, that you're growing. So the production capacity for hemp is there. Um, we needed someone to specify and call out the short fiber issue. And when we have solutions like that at scale, then, then the world can think differently about building up an industry where the fiber length is a little less important to, to what the Ralph Lorenz, et cetera, of the world want to make clothing out of. Um, that's, the, that, that's one key thing I'll say, that's especially on the, on the knits and the wovens side of the industry, that, that length of fiber and its cost point, depending on how, what, you know, form of redding and then mechanical or, or chemical um, cottonization is used that, that makes all the difference in, in today's world, but then tomorrow's world might be different, so. Okay, so I've got a question that John just asked, and John, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask it if you'd like about the manufacturing and Composites. Hi, Luke. Thanks very much for your time. It's John Carpenter from Vast Lab. Um, you'd mentioned migrating towards uh, natural fibers and the challenges with non homogeneity as you have with you know, synthetic fibers. And historically in the US, non woven mats and other types of secondary processes have been geared towards that, that hydrocarbon based polymer, right? To what degree have you seen? non-woven mat equipment being adopted in the United States that's been designed for the use of natural fibers and not for the use of synthetic fibers. And yeah. or you see non-woven mat making machinery that has been designed for synthetic fibers modified or tried to be modified to accommodate some of the irregularities you find in natural fibers. Yeah, I, I think that um, the way I would answer your question, John, to make sure I understood it correctly is, is first and foremost, that there is a bunch of equipment that's optimized to use plastics as an input. And, um, but the modifications for naturals aren't, I mean, it depends on what application we're talking about perhaps, but since you asked about non-woven, I don't see a whole lot of strong limitations, uh, save for one. So you can take, you know, different kinds of, um, ways of having a web and pull and, and align fibers or not, right? And lay air lay or or water lay materials and, and do all that. And then you come down to, okay, there's a lot of people today that are mixing natural materials in with plastics. And it's that because um, they still want the plastic in there because they want to have something that will melt and that can be molded and shaped later. So, and that's all around the fact that plastics, of course, when you heat them up, or many of them anyway, when you heat them up, they, they flow again. And they, so um, I would say the, the issue is less on the, the modification of machines that make the mats and more about what kinds of manufacturing processes you're gonna put those mats into on the backside, because if it could be 100% natural and you weren't mixing polypropylene with hemp to make that car door inside panel, and where it was 100% hemp, or hemp plus a 
natural fiber welding, all natural resin, let's say, that gets you the molding and the shaping. Well, then, then you've got a very different scenario. I mean, yeah, okay, it's, it's those, those processes that are going to handle those mats and, and do that molding and shaping later are not exactly the same and that needs to be built. But once they are, and you've got a system now that handles 100% natural things, 100% natural things can be ground up at the end of their life and be scattered back on fields and turned back into dirt and be soil amendment. You don't even have to compost them because they're just nutrients, just like a tree can be ground up. You don't have to compost a tree to safely, you know, return it to the soil and grind it up. So I would say the biggest limitation I see, John, is not in the making of the mat, but in the processing and the molding and the shaping and what you're going to do with those mats from a manufacturing standpoint to turn it into the various kinds of products that people want to make from those materials. Good Thank question. You. Thank you. Great question. Um, so talking about performance, there was a question, what performance metrics do you know that have changed or to change when you're blending hemp and cotton, hemp and tinsel, or hemp and other synthetics? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, to, to be more quantitative, I'll just speak to some things in the, from the cotton industry. So if your fiber is longer than about 26, let's say it's 26, 27, maybe even as much as 28 millimeter average fiber length, then depending on where it grew in the world, you might call it Sapima or Pima cotton, you might call it Egyptian extra long staple, et cetera. People pay a very healthy price um, for fiber that is that long. If your fiber is, um, you know, I don't know, I, I didn't check the commodity board today and see, but, you know, let, let's say uh, something like a buck 50 a pound or something like that for the highest quality, about 1% of the world's cotton is that extra long staple variance. Um, but 99% of cotton or something is staple length of, of 25, 24, 22 millimeter, 23 millimeter. Once you start getting below um, 22, 21, 20 millimeters, you're talking about the fiber that people run um, combing equipment, for example, to try to get rid of. They want to get that out of their, their sliver before they spin the yarn because the fiber, that short fiber is going to pill. It's going to make the yarn weak, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I'm not an, an expert on some other people on, on the call might speak up and tell me what is their staple length when they cottonize hemp, like where that fits into that, that gradient that I just laid out. But I'll say, you know, people pay a buck 50 a pound for the best stuff. They pay about 70 cents a pound uh, for, you know, the, what we would call upland cotton uh, in the US. Uh, and then people pay to get rid of those some percentage of cotton that is, you know, roughly below an inch or something like that in length. And what we're doing is we're telling people, hey, go ahead and put in your short, either leave the short fiber in or taking post-industrial and post-consumer wastes, working with people who spin yarns and, and, and can spin, you know, let's call it mediocre quality or even low quality yarns out of those very short fibers. And then we take that and we know, you know, we do this and we convert it to this. And then when that happens now, you actually get huge strength increases. You get moisture wicking, you get, um, you know, no pill, the, the abrasion resistance, therefore the fabric goes up. W what we're working on is processes too, that allow us to leave some fuzz in the right place so that you don't suffer on hand feel or anything like, or it's actually an adjustable parameter that brands get to play with. So um, I don't know off the top of my head, again, where hemp, when you cotton, again, it really depends on what redding and when did you harvest the crop and did it stay in the field this long or that long, or did you put it in this pond to do this kind of enzyme treatment or not, right? That all has an effect on what that final fiber quality is, but that's where we get back to standards. If, if you can have a standard where cottonized hemp um, can be graded out bale to bale in a, in a similar way to cotton, then anyway, there's, there's ways to, to create markets around those standards. Um, thank you, Luke. Any, are there any questions? I see a couple that are coming in, but again, just to remind people that have just joined it, joined, if you do have questions, don't hesitate to drop them in the, in the chat. Um, Amy, I know you had to drop off. I don't know if you wanted to add anything or if you're, you're good. Do you have anything you'd like to add? 
Just that um, I've had the opportunity now to hear Luke speak twice, and I think that this is extremely exciting as we look forward at the textiles that will be used and touched by human skin. Uh, you know, I think the potential for what it can do with recycled textiles, recycled fibers. There's some of you who know I'm speaking to you right now. I won't call you out. Um, this could be this could be really exciting. And um, from you know the the apparel side, from both the mass apparel all the way up to luxury, I think that there's huge potential for what this could do to the United States supply chain if we can really get it to work and if we can all pull our thoughts together and share. So everybody, yes, I do have to unfortunately drop off very soon, but I, but I think it's super encouraging. Amy, one, one of the things um, we can talk about sometime is NFW is actively, well, we're, we're in the middle of a fundraise and that will be done here quite pretty, pretty soon, I, I think. Um, and then one of the things we're doing is we're building a large scale process facility that won't process raw hemp in the sense of cottonizing it, but we'll take the output, let's say, from cottonized hemp and we'll be spinning and, and welding yarn, you know, doing this fiber welding process on yarn and making fabrics that perform and, and already have customers that are lined up and want to start buying metric tons per day and where we'll be able to be processing many metric tons per day um, with a factory in the United States. And why in the United States? Well, number one is it's a highly automated process, just like yarn spinning is automated. So, you know, when machines are doing the work, you need highly skilled engineers and things to oversee all the, the multiplexed robots doing their thing, basically. And then the other is the U.S. is a powerhouse for growing materials. And when you can stop having to put things on ships, all of a sudden the ability for brands to not have to warehouse or wait and, and cut down their supply length. It's not just a cost and a savings of fuel thing. It's a, it's a real inventory thing for when you talk about recycling fabrics and, and things like that. So happy to talk with you about that sometime. I look forward to it. That'd be great. Yes, definitely. Amy's up to a lot of good. So uh, thank you, Amy, for joining. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, there's a couple of questions here. One, a shout out that Luke, I don't know if you are willing or would be interested in participating in the ASTM standards. There's always talk about developing the standards around the fiber industry. And so um, I would love to connect you or help connect. I know Bill can as yeah, well. Yeah, sure. I I, I, at bare minimum, I want to be aware of it because I'll say, you know, NFW, one of the things that we're really doing today is we're, we're engaging in already existing commodity, you know, biomaterial markets, right? So there are, there are standard markets for cork powder. So because the wine bottle industry exists and because the flooring industry exists um, that uses cork for flooring and things. There, therefore, is a waste byproduct that comes out of that, which is there's little scraps and things that get ground up into dust, and you can get very well characterized, standardized amounts of dust. More of the same with things like balsa and other kinds of like sawdust. You can get well characterized amount, very, and that's very low cost, by the way, too. That's another nice thing about using nature is these things are very abundant. But we're engaging these commodity uh, industries that exist working on them, just understanding our company needs to understand like what kind of standard, again, eggs, flour, sugar, or water, right? Like what kinds of standards can we take in? How do we characterize those? And then how do we build that into our recipes to go make Miram leather-like materials, for example, for, for everything from like my wallet here is made out of Miram, right? To, you know, there's, there's other formulations that maybe I, I, should be, I think that this is public, so I can show this one. Like here's a, when, when the Olympic, the 2020 Olympics didn't happen, right? But the, but the 21 Olympics are happening and Ralph Lauren has announced that this is on Olympians. So there's everything from little applications that you didn't ever think about, like how many patches in the world are on just denim and how much material that turns out to be and what kind of formulations might you use there all the way to what goes inside your interior of your automobile. Or your home, and and so standardy standard commoditized markets are everything for a company like ours. Because what we can't do is engage, you know, an automotive brand that wants 
hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, hundreds of millions of square feet per year for ranges of automobiles, and then have our standards change on us in the in the middle of of a production run, right? So that means a lot of work on the front end. In in many cases, we're just piggybacking on industries that are already out there and they already exist. They have their standards. And in other in cases of hemp, I take these calls. Um, because number one, I've got a bunch of like-minded people to talk to, but number two is um, there's some real opportunity to define very carefully what is the best standard, you know, set of things to choose. And then when we have that, we'll have another wonderful ingredient to be using to make these kinds of materials and, and even more so locally. Can I ask, and when we were showing, you were showing some of the different products you had created and then said, well, we'll come back to those a little bit later. I'm curious about what is the product that's going into each of those and what are we looking at for volume? You know, what's available? When you said earlier, you know, mentioning the shorter fiber, fiber staper fibers, what's volume that we're looking at? Um, when you say volume, specify further, like volume for NFW or like mark the overall worldwide markets for these kinds of both. Both. I, I'm I'm clueless to production and what is actually needed from field into okay. a, a yeah. garment, right? And so if you can kind of shed light to, yeah, production or what you're seeing, especially working in the automotive space, what are we looking yeah. at in the industry to, you know, connect those dots? So let's talk about uh, leather and leather-like materials. Okay. So there's roughly a hundred billion with a B. $100 billion worth of leather that goes into the world each year. There's another about that much worth of synthetic uh, leather. And by the way, from a volume perspective, there's actually more synthetic. The synthetics tend to be a little less expensive than, than your normal chrome tan or whatever leather. Um, but let's call it, you know, something like a $200 billion market in this world of leather-like materials. Um, and, and so, you know, that's, that's a pretty big market. About 80% of the leather and leather-like market is automotive footwear and furniture. So when you read about people's, um, you know, I'll just say there's some, some folks that have ideas about leather alternative. And then one of the things you need to look out for is if they're using plastic because the doesn't help. Maybe you're in the same boat as you're going to may have a bio thing and then coat it with polyurethane. It doesn't make it more sustainable or more circular or make it non-toxic at the end of its life, right? It's got to be either all natural or I don't know, you might as well make it synthetic. Certain kinds of synthetics at least have a chance maybe of, of recycling. Um, okay. But, but 80% of the market is, is those Again, footwear, furniture, auto interiors, 20% of the market is things like wallets and, and apparel and handbags and things like that. So, um, and then we can talk about like tonnage of, of these markets. When, if, if you stop and think about like $100 billion worth of leather, here's, here's another thing people don't recognize about that industry. Um, there's about, well, there used to be about, I don't know, 150 almost 200 years ago now, before Wild Bill was shooting all of the buffalo that were all the bison that were in America, there was something like a herd of estimates vary somewhere between 40 and as much as 60 million bison roaming the Great Plains. Um, they're actually less efficient ruminants than modern cows, um, by the way. So they were all producing their methane too. It was biogenic though, because they're all plant-based. Um, and so um, and we traded that herd for about 93 million or so, about 90 million head of cattle in the U.S. And, and then you think about like, there's a lot of, by the way, and there's a lot of intensity in raising animals like cattle. That don't, I'm not being flippant about the, the you know, the, the resources of that, but, but I'll just say it's um, some, depending on who you are and what you care about. Anyway, sometimes information like this uh, disturbs some people. Maybe it's edifying to others. Um, the, the point I'm trying to make, though, is you think about a certain number of cattle that are turned into meat each year, then a byproduct of that is the, the hide. And the hide sells for next to nothing. In fact, there's a lot of hides that get thrown into landfills these days because it, um, the real, the true cost of leather 
is using petrochemicals and, and different processes to churn it into something that's not going to rot and smell bad if you bought something made of that and churn it into something that's more like a man-made semi-synthetic that um, you know turns it into something that, um, again, we have to render out the fat, you have to do these things. If you think about it though, think about all the feed that goes to cows to make, to grow a cow versus, you know, how much of the cow actually gets used to make leather. It's a very small fraction. If you look at like U.S. Department of Agriculture, you can look at how much a packing plant gets paid on average and what their percentage of revenues is for the hide versus the rest of the cow. Anyway, you'll find that the hide is not worth a whole lot and almost all the money and the resources is going into conversion. Okay, why do I tell you all that? It's because um, there's, there's several orders of magnitude difference between the amount of plant materials that go towards feeding cows versus what the cow actually in the end outputs as a hide that gets turned into leather. In, in other words, it, the only reason why leather works is because it's, it is and always has been a, a waste product, something that's more valuable, which is the meat. And so, um, but Miram, Miram takes the plants and goes directly to the material. So that is an efficiency that is just like absolutely, anyway, you can't beat it because if you can just go straight from the plants to the thing that you wanted and, and you can bypass the, the petrochemical refinery and you can bypass all the other things and you can just do mixing and baking and make, then there's no system that has a lower impact or will have a better efficiency than that. And therefore, can can I can tell you, and that's why natural fiber welding, even though we're a small company and a startup, when we talk to big companies about the price points that we're able to get to and the kinds of volumes that we're able to get to, we're relevant today with price points that are, oh, you pay this for leather? Okay, well, we can talk about how you can pay the same price for quality Miram. Um, and, and then where those prices go down through time because the plants are just more abundant orders of magnitude more abundant. Uh, and, and therefore, we can also talk about the fact that, you know, there, there's a reason in this world why you have about 2 billion people on planet Earth that get to live like me and my family. And then there's billions of people on planet Earth that don't get to live the same. Why is that? Because, and then you see conflict all over the world for the petrochemical inputs. Well, plastics are actually relatively expensive to do try and, and relatively, uh, you know, problems with trying to get 8 billion people to live like I do or something, right? So, but if you can do it directly from plants, that efficiency allows more people to live better with less conflict, it allows us to engage industries that are much larger than the leather industry. So like, for instance, the, the amount of hemp that we actually need, let's, let's imagine that a formulation like this, let's imagine that half of the weight of this material is, a, is both hemp fiber in the non-woven part of this. And let's say we go to an all hemp backer material on this, okay? And, and let's say 50% of this market is, or 50% of the weight of this, of the Miram is hemp. And then we compute and we say, what if natural fiber welding took over $100 billion, took over the entire leather market? How much, how many acres of hemp would we need? And the answer is, well, you could easily support it with acreage in Illinois and then some. And then we'd, we'd, ha we'd have to be finding, um, you know, we'd, we'd also be using the herds for formulations, you know, and foams and things like this or something. So you would have other uses for the crop too. So the, the abundance of, a, of, and the ability to have acres, you just can't understand, but many of you I'm sure can understand when you look at a green field, how amazingly abundant that can be using solar energy relative to really intensive manufacturing that comes out of plastics or for that matter, even, you know, catalogs and things like that. Cool. So I don't know if that answered questions or if that. Is yeah. I, by the way, if, if I was oh, no. not specific enough, re-ask the question and I'll answer in one paragraph the next time. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to, I guess, put into perspective and when we spoke earlier, the just what materials and what opportunity is there already? Yeah, the big, able the to biggest. Be the biggest by far is the cottonization. So textiles is three is something like, depending on whose reports you read, it's something like $3 trillion per year. I mentioned 100 billion pounds of polyester 
55 billion pounds of cotton. That's like 90, let's call it at least 90% of the tonnage. There's about 9 billion pounds of man-made cellulosics that come from, you know, like modal tensile. Uh, Lensing makes a really nice product, right, from, from beechwood trees and things like that. But that's a very, that's pretty small compared to cotton crops and, and uh, polyester production. So when we're talking about roughly 100 and, you know, let, let's say 160 or so billion pounds of material in a year, then by far the biggest opportunity in the fiber space for hemp would be the entities that figure out how to standardize cottonization of hemp and then work with NFW on how we turn it into what the big brands want to make their t-shirts and their blue jeans and their you know, shells for, for winter coats and things out of a new performance aspect of hemp that people didn't think was possible before, but now it is. So that, that's, that's by far the biggest industry. Again, just think about how large is the cotton industry. Hemp could be at least that big, if not bigger. You know, especially when you can have farmers in certain places in the world can grow multiple crops per year. So that, that evens out supply chain too, by the way. Um, you know, cotton crops, they, they, or you can go read the reports about where the co cotton harvest is happening, depending on what season we're in or what month of the year we're in. And, um, but but it goes around in a way that's a little different when hemp crops can grow in northern latitudes where cotton crops don't grow, or if they grow in equatorial regions and you get multiple crops. That's a that's a evening out of supply chain that has a potential big advantage. So figure that one out. Figure out the cottonization of hemp in a way that's scalable and that delivers uh, the, the fiber length and, and price. And then in the meantime, well, not just in the meantime, and NFW will help move that equation along because we're able to use the short fiber. It's okay. Um, there's quite a bit of conversation that comes up around the life cycle, you know, and running running tests on the full sustainability of the product. Um, I saw that there was a question. I don't know if anybody is on. I saw, I'll scroll through here and find it, but Talk to me about this, you know, the sustainability, the carbon footprint, um, wh what we're doing, as, especially being driven by consumers instead of necessarily being pushed by brands. What are you seeing as this shift um, for products? And again, I think it, you know, uncovers more opportunity uh, for the hemp industry. But what are you seeing, especially on? Yeah, the, I mean, I think there's a huge push for naturals. I mean, I, I think. Again, you can show green fields and you can show oil rigs feeding ships, feeding pipelines, feeding refineries, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see, you know, which one. Anyway, they, they both have their impacts in their own ways. I'll, I'll say that one of the big pushes I see is not just growing a natural crop, but getting down to the aggregate da data of where did that crop come from? Because, you know, if we're going to burn down the Amazon rainforest to to grow more cattle or more soybeans or something, that's not, um, you know, wrecking diversity at the expense of volume is, is, is not a good thing at all. So um, I think so long as agriculture embraces the regenerative side of, so in other words, no-till and, and those things that tend to build the biome up such that carbon is sunk and you build soil on longer timescales. And so long as you've got data that supports that your hemp that you're growing comes from a region that already was a prairie. And so basically you're putting something that's a lot like what the prairie was back on the prairie. Um, and you're not, um, and, and by the way, giving farmers in the Midwest to boot more opportunities to grow things other than corn and soybeans and more corn and soybeans and more corn and more corn and more corn, like getting, getting diversity of crop up is a is a big deal and i think you see a lot of support both from consumers who don't probably know the technical details so much but big support particularly from those brands that already today might make things out of cotton but it's not hard to convince them that if they could make it out of hemp there's a, there's wonderful stories there um you know because of some of the natures of the agro economics and the agro um sort of uh technical side of the kinds of supply chain storytelling you can do that are 
quantifiable about things like water footprint, pesticide use or not, ultimate carbon footprint, if we're talking regen, those kinds of things. So I think huge push for natural. And then it comes down to the devils in the details of people can document their supply chain. They win. Those are the ones that win. Perfect. There's another question. Gotham or Gotham. Hello, sir. Thank, yeah. Thank you, Mandy. Yes. Uh, so look, uh, so I just wanted to ask you, so for every car that we buy, right. And they ask us whether we want leather seats. And so basically it's not leather. Every leather is coated with plastic or some mm -hmm. sort of uh, finish, right? Many are, many are. There, there are some leather that aren't coated, but a huge amount of them are, especially in automotive. There's, there's many, yep. Yeah, to, to remove the smell or mm -hmm. it, all the chemicals are there, right? So your product, Miriam, uh, does it crack later on in the future? Like after like no. five to 10 years? No. So, well, okay. Miram isn't five or 10 years old yet, but we've done accelerated testing with a number of people and shown basically, you know, it, I guess I could say if, if you imagine a leather material that's made from elements like natural rubber, which, you know, natural rubber um, is made into car tires today. Actually, here's another case of a natural thing that gets turned into a synthetic because today rubber is cured for your car tire with uh, peroxide or sulfur plus petrochemical accelerants. And the reason why people have latex allergies, for example, most of them um, anyway, are very allergic to the petrochemical accelerants in the, in the cure of rubber. But okay, you know that rubber is a very durable material. It's so durable, it's the basically the shoe for your car. Um, and then we could talk about cork and other lignocellulosics that are very durable materials in their own, own right. And, so you can imagine if, if I'm telling you though, that Miram is, is a composite that's made from these natural inputs that themselves are quite durable. And then instead of breaking those materials down, we mix them together and we make those complex composites. And you can understand that just like nature already is durable, therefore probably the durability transfers to a product like Miram and it does. So the initial testing that we've done, you know, wallets like this have been in my pocket now for, um, close to two years and they just keep performing exactly like you think they should. And then we do advanced, you know, ultraviolet and cold crack testing. There, there's a whole battery of tests that the automotive industry, for example, or the furniture industry has people go through before they'll adopt your products. And I'll say there hasn't been a, a, a big issue that we've bumped into. In fact, there's, there's even some synergies there because remember plastic, what makes plastic so melt manufacturable in some cases that they melt is actually an Achilles heel because um, in, in certain situations where you want fire retardancy, one of the biggest problems with plastic is plastic, when it takes on heat, it can melt and drip, which the flame, but natural materials don't do that. They char on that. So that means that you don't have to put in nasty brominated compounds into Miram in order to get it to pass certain kinds of flame specs. You don't, in fact, one of the hard rules I have on natural fiber welding is we don't ever allow ourselves to even go there and think about using those kinds of nasty things because um, anyway, like it's, it's, it's not worth the cost, the, the environmental cost, basically, in my opinion. So we don't do it. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering your question exactly, uh, Galton, but yeah. Yeah, you did. Uh, so since even your client Porsche, uh, did they use the interior interior padding or did they use it for the seats or the dashboard? Oh, we, the, yeah, that, there was a proof of concept. So when you Google and you see pictures, what you'll see is a proof of concept uh, door wrapped door part. So the, the major thing there was um, the the companies that make the interior parts for automobiles. The there, there's actually some the, the toughest part in some cases is just making the part. So if, if you look at that car door panel that's out there, you'll see some complex geometries and things where the, the uh, Miram had to stretch. In fact, that's one of the superpowers of Miram is we can make it stretch more than leather and more than synthetics a lot of times do. And so um, the, the biggest challenge oftentimes is just, can you make complex geometries? Can you fit into the cutting and the sewing? Can you fit into the existing uh, manufacturing processes that the automotive industry has. Um, so that, that was a proof to show that. And then now we're deep in the weeds in the kinds of things you, you were referencing earlier, like 
advanced long-term, uh, you know, testing for watching how long colors hold and if there's any cracks that appear after so many hours or how, how many cycles of hot car to cold car, et cetera. Um, we're doing those things, but so far so good. Thanks, Luke. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we kind of spoke about this earlier and we're about at um, our hour. And so I just want to throw this out that there are a lot of questions in our chat about the process of getting the hemp from the field to this to Luke or to the shirt, yeah. right? And where that picks up. And so you wanted to speak let, to that? Let me suggest two uh, straightforward ways. Number one is let's start with the pith or herds, whatever, you're, whatever you want to call it. If, if we have folks out there that can grind those materials into fine powders that are similar to like the sawdust or the cork powder industry, then those are uh, material and, and do it repeatably then those are materials that NFW would be very happy to you know, take samples of and do some formulating around and through time, you know, try to develop a market around. Um, on the cottonization side, or whether it's making for, if there's anyone that's got just all natural hemp uh, non-wovens, those, those can be of interest or more pertinent is there's, um, we're, we're starting to talk with some folks about um, very specific projects where we we spin yarns that have different qualities of hemp fiber from cottonization. So we don't do the cottonization, but we let other people be the experts in doing that. But insofar as people have cottonization processes that have very standard, or they think they have a standard way of doing something and they can reproduce a fiber, then we can do spinning trials and NFW can go make fabrics um, from spun yarns that have gone through our processes and and you know, go test them out with um, with the Ralph Lorenz of the world and, and the wear trials that we're doing with the, you know, at the Naval Academy and things like that. Cool. So, Luke, I want to thank you very, very much. I know that you're pressed for time and I really appreciate you joining. Um, I'm happy to stay on and continue conversation if you guys would like to talk about anything else. I have another half hour that I can stay on if you guys have questions or if there's anybody on that wants to talk about the processing part, right? From seed decorticating all of these pieces before it gets to Luke. Um, I know when we were on earlier, we were just saying that that is not, you know, not where his expertise is, but there are a ton of questions. And so, yeah, that's right. I'll, I'll, again, when you get answers to those questions, Mandy and others, then I'll regular, regular fiber, graded fiber inputs are, are what we're looking for and what we're creating markets around through time. So, well, and thank you again. For those of you that are logging off or that are going to sign off, just a, a reminder that for those of you that have signed in today and joined us, I will send an email with a link to the video and try transcribe notes for this um, meeting so that you guys will be able to go back and reference and kind of learn and see what's going on. Uh, equally as much, if you guys have any questions or again, need help connecting, don't hesitate to holler at me. And then next Thursday, uh, Julie Lerner from Pan Exchange is going to be talking about the a carbon exchange, what's involved in carbon sequestration and the exchange of carbon. Um, and that's Thursday, two o'clock. You can find all of our links for our meetings on our website. And then um, joining our membership is um, also available on the website as well. So thank you very much again, Luke, for, for everything today. And again, if anybody else has questions, don't hesitate to um, you know join or shout out. I'm willing to listen. So thanks thank everybody. Yeah. Uh, so one second, uh, Luke, Yeah. is he going? Okay, no, so uh, yeah, you're asking for the sawdust material, right? I just saw a video uh, from AG Processing Solutions from Andrew Bishop. He just posted a video uh, similar to your requirement. Maybe okay. you should check that out. Yeah. Okay, yeah. We'll Actually, that's what Thank I was you. showing you earlier. Same. Same bag. Okay, tremendous. Well, thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate you. I appreciate your time. There's not anything else or anybody else who would like to jump in. Um, again, next week we only have one event. And so I feel like I can breathe, but I hope all of you can come back and join us. I'm really excited about the speakers and the subjects and getting to know you. So someone on my team will be reaching out uh, to connect within the next couple of days and follow up. And thanks again, John, for the towel. I appreciate you. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. See you later, guys.